right? So we should be recording there. But um, right. So as I was mentioning last week, um, we have we have these, these six big sections, but Cisco heavily weighted for the first three, right? Um, so I tried to spend as much time as I could on the first three sections um, because they are the heavy, well, the heaviest weighted. And because, you know, when it all starts off, you're really not too sure what the CCNA is about and what we're talking about um, with the infrastructure devices and everything. So now um, we have, well, we have a lot more theory to, to cover, but is is much less weighted, you know, it's like much lighter. Um, so basically all of these points are 1% each. Um, so in this class, we're going to actually cover um, NCP, DHCP and DNS, SNMP, Syslog, and then some configurations of DHCP. Um, so it's, it's a bunch of small topics. Um, so if, if after the class, you know, um, you want to know more about the topic or you're just confused about the purpose of any of these features or any of these IP services, um, let me know and I could do, you know, a mini video on it or um, this next class I, I could explain it a bit more. Um, this this will be a heavy topic when you reach quality of service. Um, but again, I don't want to spend you know a whole class on these things because it's just one percent. Um, so I don't want you to focus too much on these topics and forget the heavy stuff. Um, so today we're gonna cover the whole of presentation nine. Um, I'm gonna take a little break in between. So I'm gonna split the presentation into, and I'll just take a five minutes to rest my voice in between um, and, and make sure you all. Um, could absorb the first half before I go into the second half. And, and then once I finish, you will could do lab 16 whenever you're ready. Um, so for the remainder of the course, we will be pushing a bit more on the theory side because these topics are very heavy on the theory. Um, so they, they're not so heavy on the configuration, but they're heavy on the theory because there's so many little topics. Um, so, so let me know if I'm going too fast. Let me know if I need to stop um, anywhere in the presentation. And I will stop and I'll talk more about the topic. Um, if you want. Uh, I hope I, I included enough details in each topic, but, but let me know. I'll keep watching the chat. Um, right, so wait, first let's just um, go up over what we did in the last week or two. Um, so this is the heaviest topic um, in, in the whole of CCNA, right? It's 25%, which is um, the, well, the, the most heavily weighted topic here. So just to recap, we covered the routing table. Um, and by now, you should know what a routing table looks like. It looks like a table. Um, and you should know how to read it, you know, left to right or top to bottom or however you're most comfortable reading it. You should be able to just look at the information there and interpret it. Um, and then we covered how the router makes, well, how the router reads that table to forward packets using the longest match lookup and the ADs and the metrics. Um, then we went into two ways in which a router could populate the table. Um, one, using static routing, which is basically us telling the router, if you want to go to this network, or if you want to go to this host, then go to this IP, or, or send this packet to this IP. Um, or another way of looking at it is, um, for every packet that you get in, look at the destination address. And for that destination address, go through the routes in this table, and look for the network routes, look for the host routes, um, and well, it won't look at the floating static route because that won't be in the table um, normally. But look through the network routes and then look through any host routes. But if any host specifically, if you don't find an entry for that or, or a match in a row in the table, then send it out the default route. Um, if you go through the whole table and you can't even find a default route to, to send the packet to, then drop the packet and send back an ICMP reject message um, saying destination not reachable. You know, basically, I don't have a route to send this packet to. Um, but we saw that static routing, while very useful and while great for understanding routing on the whole, um, it is not scalable and we can't build big networks with it. So we talked about OSPF. Um, we, we did a brief overview of dynamic routing protocols on the whole. Um, and I, I, I mentioned, you know, a few, EIGRP, OSPF, RIP, BGP, um, all of these things, but Cisco only wants to focus on OSPF v2. Um, so we mentioned areas, and we said, you know, areas are just a, a group of routers in, in an OSPF network or in, in an object running OSPF, um, and each area has its own database. So we could split up networks into different areas in OSPF, 
but Cisco just wants us to know um, single area OSPF, and that's why they spelled it out here, single area. Um, so don't worry about the complications there. And then OSPF V2, so don't worry about IPv6 for this. So we went through neighbor adjacencies, you know, how, how OSPF routers talk to each other, um, the special multicast addresses that they use, the, the special hello messages, um, the types of interfaces, so whether they are broadcast interfaces or point-to-point -point interfaces, um, and then we went through the whole the election process for broadcast links. So you see, that's why DR and BDR are in the broadcast section here, because this doesn't happen for point-to-point -point links. Um, but we went through priorities and how you could set a, a powerful router to be a DR, um, and you know, your, your second most powerful router to be a BDR, and make sure the, the unstable routers in the network don't get elected as these important elements. Um, and we also went through how you could manually set your router ID um, to make sure your network is, well, make sure your database is consistent and make sure you know exactly which routers are sending messages um, in your OSPF network by tracking this router ID. Um, and we also went through the election process for this. So how does a router choose its router ID if you don't manually set it? Um, uh, that's why we mentioned the loopback interface, right? Remember that special interface, um, the router ID plays in into that loopback interface. It plays a very um, important role. And then we, we went through what is called first hop redundancy protocols, um, which is basically that thing I showed you where um, you have two routers to exit a network instead of one, um, which is the first hop out of an office network or, or a small enterprise network, um, which is the gateway of the network. So we didn't go through into any configurations or, or any um, protocols in detail because Cisco just wants you to know the purpose of it. So describe the purpose of the first hop redundancy protocol, um, which is basically if you if you have a gateway in a network, you want to make sure that if that router goes offline, another router could take up the, the job of that gateway, right? Um, so that's why it's called first hop redundancy protocol. That first hop gateway, um, we want to put in some redundancy in it. And we went through... Um, the, well, the elements of that at a high level, of course. Um, and then lastly, we went through NAT. So we said NAT or network address translation is the process of taking the source IP address of a packet and translating it to another IP address in a nutshell. So um, there are multiple forms of NAT and NAT could get very complicated. Um, a lot of engineers will tell you it's breaking the internet and you know, you're not supposed to be doing that, but it has become essential because of that depletion of IPv4 addresses, the, the public IPv4 addresses that I mentioned. Um, so basically we can't get out to the internet without this thing called NAT, uh, specifically inside source NAT, which is just, it's one form of NAT, but it is the most popular um, form of NAT that we, we come across. Um, so. That in that um, last bit of the presentation, we spoke about how we could do static NAT, which is basically take this private IP, convert it to this public IP, and then send it out to the internet. Um, and you're only doing that translation or that mapping for one private IP and one public IP, um, which isn't too useful, but it is interesting to, to understand the concept. And then we extended that concept into pools. So we said, if we have this entire pool of private addresses, as you might have an entire pool of private addresses, um, inside your home, take that entire pool of IP addresses, put it in an access control list on ACL, and then if you see a packet coming from this pool, then translate it to either a single public address or a pool of public addresses or a range of public addresses. Um, and we saw the commands for that in the last class. So go back through that um, if you need to, and we also had a lab on that, I believe. Uh, lab, yeah, lab 14. Um, so redo lab if you're unfamiliar with those concepts. So today we're going to go through uh, 4.2 to 4.6, I believe. 4.2 to 4.6, right. So let's get started with the material for today. So pointer, right. Um, let me know if you're not seeing the pointer or if you're not seeing the slides. Um, but it should be good. So we're going to go through um, basically a bunch of other protocols or a bunch of other services that help that IP layer process. So we just discussed how NAT helps that layer by helping um, hosts in a private network communicate out to the internet. That is basically the purpose of NAT. Uh, or that's, that's the most widely used form of NAT. There are other uses, but, but that's the most um, widely used one. 
So today we're going to go through some other important protocols that do similar services. Right, so configuring NTP. The network time protocol, or NTP, is used to synchronize time or clocks between devices across a network. It is extremely important in correlating events between different network devices. In your own day-to-day -day operations, you may be fine with your clock having small deviations from each other in the range of a few seconds or, you know, even a few minutes in some of our watches. However, when you have an outage or issue, you will be extremely reliant on your timestamps in your logs being in sync. So basically what we're saying here is if you do a, a show clock on, on a Cisco device, you know, um, if you check the time on router 1 and you check the time on router 2, that time needs to be basically exactly in sync. Um, you can't afford for that to be off by even a few seconds. And the reason for that is if if uh, issue happens on router 2 and you troubleshoot on router 2 and you're trying to figure out, okay, why did this issue happen? You will probably end up going to router 1 and switch 1 and whatever else you have connected to router 2 to try to figure out what triggered um, this outage or, or what triggered this change. And when you're comparing the logs, um, between those routers, you want to see, okay, X happened, then Y happened, then Z happened. Um, and the only way you can do that is by watching the clock. So you'll see a timestamp on the logs, and you'll say, okay, at 4.45, this thing happened, then at 4.45.1 seconds, this other thing happened. So you know this happened after that thing happened. And the only way you can correlate things across different devices is if the clocks um, between all of them synced. And NTP is very important for making sure that that happens. So NTP servers are hierarchical with stratum zero servers at the top. So these stratum zero servers are like super um, reliable time sources, right? Then you have stratum one servers below them. Um, so you yeah, just have a, a top to bottom structure, stratum zero servers are at the top and they will be like, you know, super, super um, accurate time servers. And as you go down the hierarchy, you'll get less and less accurate um, because each server will be kind of piggybacking off the, the upper layer ones. So NTP uses UDP port 123 for its operations. The current version of NTP is version 4, but version 4 is backwards compatible with version 3. So this is what we're talking about, right? We have atomic or radio clocks, which are, you know, super expensive. Um, and you, do, you don't even see these at ISPs usually. Um, but, you know, there are places like the government and, you know, universities and stuff that will have these things. And they are shot on zero. They will be perfectly in sync. They'll have perfect time in a nutshell. Um, then you'll have servers connected to these, these super cool sources. Um, and they'll be less accurate than the shot on zero servers. Um, so these will be shot on one. Then you'll have two, then three, then four. So it's a chain. So basically, we will point to like a shot on seven or a shot on eight. And that will in turn point to a three which will turn point to a 2, which will turn point to a 1. So just a big chain of time servers. And at each hop, we get less accurate information, um, you know, because we, we keep going out further and further away from the actual accurate source. But we can't all connect to the Stratum 0 server. The, the Stratum 0 clocks will become, you know, overwhelmed by everybody pointing to them. And these things might be, you know, in Germany or, or deep in the U.S., um, so it'll take us a, a very long time to keep syncing with these things. So it, it makes sense to develop this large network um, to pull load off of these things. Now, most Cisco devices can act as both NTP servers as well as NTP clients. To configure a Cisco device as an NTP client, we use the command NTP server and the IP address for that, um, where XXX is the IP address or host name of the NTP server that we are pointing um, our client towards. So it kind of back to front there, you're saying NTP client, and then you're putting in the command NTP server, but think of it like we want to configure our Cisco device as an NTP client, so we are pointing it to an NTP server at this address. So we are saying Cisco device, your NTP server is going to be um, whatever this IP address is or whatever this host name is. Therefore, you are going to become an IP client. So just as an example, NTP server pool.ntp.org means this core router is going to become an NTP client of this NTP server, yeah? Um, so once we do that, we then use the show NTP associations and show NTP status commands to check whether our NTP client has successfully synchronized with its server. Note that this process usually takes a few minutes. 
Um, so there's a, a very important thing to note with NTP. I, I think I included it in the instructions um, for the NTP lab. I, I think it'll finish that already. But basically, NTP is a, is a very slow moving protocol. Um, it's not like OSPF where you know you set up your agencies and as soon as something changes, OSPF will respond within you know a few seconds for the most. Um, NTP is designed to be much slower moving because usually once your points are out of the NTP server, um, you don't change it. it. It'll synchronize and it'll, it'll stay there. It'll, it'll resynchronize and make sure it's in sync every few hours maybe, um, but it is not. It doesn't need to be fast moving, uh, and that's um, kind of similar to BGP. Whenever you encounter BGP, you realize BGP is designed to be slow moving. So below, you can see that the stratum level is 16, which means that the synchronization has not yet occurred. So if we do our show NTP associations here, you see this is stuck in init, so initialize, um, which you know means it not it not complete, it not full, um, it not actually synchronized yet. Uh, but the, the biggest giveaway here is ST16, so stratum level 16. Um, so it is not synchronized, and we still wait in. Now, if you do, right, so that's show NTP associations. If you do a show NTP status, you'll see it in, in a bit more plain text. Um, it'll tell you clock is not synchronized or clock is synchronized. So these are the two verification commands you could try um, to see if your NTP is working or not. Show NTP associations and then show NTP status. Um, and if you forget those commands, just, you know, just do show NTP and question mark, of course. Um, so in this case, you see show NTP status, and it literally tells you clock is synchronized, stratum level 3. Um, and your reference is XYZ, so this is the IP address that we are pointing towards. Um, you have a bunch of other complicated time information, but this line at the top is what we're most interested in here. We can also do the show clock command to get the current time for verification on a Cisco device. So just do a show clock, and you'll see the clock uh, or the time that this router thinks it is. Um, so you see time, and then UTC, and then date. Um, so note that this is in UTC. We, we don't use UTC in our everyday life. Uh, what we actually use is AST, Atlantic Standard Time, um, which is GMT minus four and a half hours, I believe, without daylight savings and all that madness. Um, so if you want to adjust this time zone, you can use the clock time zone name and offset. Um, and as a config level command, to change the time zone from the default of UTC. So by default, um, your time zone will be UTC because it's a kind of central time zone. Um, but you can change it to your local time if you want. So in this example, we name our time zone to CST and our offset from the UTC is minus six. So clock time zone CST minus six. You could do clock time zone AST for Atlantic Standard Time and then do minus four or minus 430. Um, if you want your local time, a lot of people, well, it depends on where you're working, right? Um, so your senior engineers might tell you they want to use local time, or they might tell you they want to use UTC because they have routers in Trinidad, they have routers in Miami, they have routers in Germany, um, they have routers in Japan, and just to get rid of all those local time variances, they just synchronize on UTC because UTC is, is one central time zone. Now let's configure our Cisco device as an NTP server instead. So all we just did was NTP client. To configure a Cisco device as an NTP server, we use the NTP master command. Um, and you, put, you can put a stratum level optionally. You don't have to, but you could. This command lets the device configure itself as an NTP server with a default stratum level of seven if another is not specified. So if you don't put this stratum level inside, it'll just say, I am stratum level seven. Additionally, you can specify the source for the NTP server with the NTP source IP um, or interface to use as source. So if you want to say, you know, use your loopback zero interface um, as the source interface, you could put that in. So for example, to let a router set itself as an NTP server with a default stratum level of seven and use itself as a time source, we configure the following command. So NTP master, so there's, there's this command here, we didn't put in a stratum level, so you're going to default to seven. And then NTP source, loopback zero. So that's the interface we're going to say is our source interface um, on this device. To verify this configuration, we use the same show NTP associations command um, to verify the NTP server status. Note that the address and the reference clock are the same since the device is configured to use its own internal source as a reference clock. So you see, this is the address that we synchronize into. 
Um, well, this is our address, and there's the reference clock. So you see, it's the same there because we're using ourselves as the, the reference clock. Um, so that's, that's the giveaway here. Both of these IPs match, so we are therefore our own source. Um, so you see, trust some level six. Yeah. Right. So you have a bunch of other time information here, which we're not too concerned about. We're concerned about the main commands. Right. So, right. So you see here. Oh, master sync here. Good. You see that as well. Um, so asterisk. Asterisk master synced. Okay. Um, configured here. Yeah. They can match up here your legend like before. So master synced and then configured to the brackets. Um, squiggly lines. Are. By default, all Cisco device interfaces are configured to act as both servers and clients. We use the NTP broadcast client command under the interface to configure that interface as a client only or set the NTP broadcast command on the interface to configure it as a server only. Um, so basically what we're saying here is if you don't change anything, your Cisco, well, all the interfaces on a Cisco device can act as both servers and clients, or they do act as both servers and clients by default. If you want to change this, um, this behavior, then you just go in config T and then interface, so int FA01 or FA um, int LO0 for loopback, and it puts NTP broadcast client if you want to do it as a client only or NTP broadcast um, if you want to configure it as a server only. So you could configure your interface to be a, a client only or a server only. If you don't do any of these commands, it will be both a server and a client. So, so this is referring to the interfaces themselves. Um, and if you're curious uh, you know, for, about more configurations and more options, check out these two links here. Right, so that was it for NTP. Uh, right on to the next protocol. So describing DHCP and DNS. Now that we understand the role of NTP in our network, let's explore the role of two other important protocols, DHCP and DNS. The Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, or DHCP, is used to manage the automate, automatic allocation of IP addresses and related parameters in our network. So far, we have mostly been configuring IP addresses statically on every single host machine that we've worked with. You can imagine how difficult this would become on networks with 10, 100, or 1,000 hosts. So we basically can't go into every single host and set up IP addresses, right? Um, even in your home, you don't, right? You, you connect to Wi-Fi and everything kind of magically works. You don't have to go in and say, uh, my phone will have 192.168.1. something, my laptop will have 192.168.1. something, uh, my desktop will have this, uh, my grandmother's phone will have this. No, yeah, you, everything just works. And DHCP is a very important part of that. So rather than configuring IP addresses, subnet masks, gateways, gateway IPs, and DNS servers, etc., statically on every single host machine in your network, you can set up a DHCP server to hand out these settings to host machines dynamically or on demand. DHCP uses UDP port 67. So you'll see each of these protocols has its own port, uh, and I try to include that information here, because uh, Cisco will sometimes test you on that. Um, so try to learn it. Say, um, well, let's make a list. That's what I did for my exam. Um, just put, you know, NTP, um, UDP uh, protocol, whatever, DHCP, UDP protocol, um, sorry, UDP port 67. Let's make a list. Uh, I think in the textbook they have, they'll have an appendix to the list as well. You can also just Google it. Um, I had Google it around and I found some interesting lists. Uh, in order to utilize DHCP servers, host machines must be configured as DHCP clients. So you see, this is the default Windows um, command. When you go into a Windows machine and you right click at the bottom of the taskbar here, um, and you, you to click, I think it's view network settings. Um, you see, eventually reach up at a page like this, right? And usually we come in this window to put, to click this radio button here and put in our IP address. So we're going to put in IP address, IP address there. Um, but by default, these two buttons are selected, which means it's going to try to use DHCP and obtain an IP address. And it's also going to try to obtain um, DNS server information from that DHCP server. So once a DHCP server has been configured and a DHCP client is added to the network, the following process takes place. So the, the four steps of DHCP are these steps. DHCP discover offer, request, and act or acknowledge. So the client wants to discover the ACP servers, then the server will see that message, and it will make an initial offer 
for IP addresses and whatever um, else it has to offer, then the client will see that offer and say, okay, that's nice. I actually want to request um, something that you have on offer. So you see the request message coming back here and the server will say, okay, I acknowledge your request. Um, this IP address is now yours. So it's a, it's a four step process there that we need to learn. Just kind of like the, the TCP three way handshake, they have the DCP four way handshake. It, it's not called a handshake, but you can think of it like that. So an easy way to remember this process is through the acronym DORA. So D O R A, discover, offer, request, acknowledge. Um, and these are the, the descriptions that I just went over. So discover, client is searching or, or trying to discover a DCP server, offer, the DCP server is sending the offer, um, offer IP address and, and similar parameters to the client. Then the client will send a request where the client requests the IP from the DCP. Um, from the DCP server and then the acknowledge. So the DCP server assigns the IP to the client and sends the acknowledgement. You can see that using this DCP protocol, we can easily assign a large number of clients, um, well, important parameters for clients. These parameters include things like IP addresses, subnet masks, gateways, DN DNS servers, NTP servers, TFTP servers, domain names, uh, and a bunch of other things. Um, there, are, there are a ton of DCP options. Uh, if you're really interested in DHCP, or if you need to do it for your own network, um, look up the RFC for, for DHCP, and there are a bunch of different codes for a bunch of different things that you can assign. Um, I have actually had to look up that RFC or, or those RFCs to find some very complicated stuff in DHCP um, for a bunch of different servers that you don't usually use. So usually in like in our home networks, we will stop at these four. So IP address, subnet mask, gateway, and DNS servers, these are the four most popular ones because this is basically what we need for normal internet access. Um, so like your flow modem or your digital modem will be configured to handle these things. But as a network admin or as a, um, you know, a network engineer of whatever kind they become, um, you may need to go into the more complicated ones for whatever niche cases you have. DHCP is really um, powerful. Now, another very important protocol using the TCP IP or, or network operations is the domain name system or DNS. DNS is a, is a system used to translate host names into IP addresses and you use it both for IPv4 as well as IPv6. Host names or URLs or FQDNs, fully qualified domain names, um, so these are the same things, are records that are easy for us to, as humans to remember. Um, so, well, actually, if you look up the, the, uh, the in-depth definition, you'll see that these things refer to, uh, well, they are technically different, but just for your understanding, think of these as the same thing. So, common examples of these things are google.com, facebook.com, and cfsi.co. So, you know these things, right? Um, if I tell you, go to google.com, you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and everybody can remember google.com easily. Um, and that's, that's really what they're designed for. It's supposed to be easy for humans to remember. However, these host names cannot be understood or used by machines. Rather, machines can only use IPv4 or IPv6 addresses directly. So these things are actually referring to servers. Um, there is a google.com server, or rather is multiple google.com servers that serve the search engine and, and serve the, the image you'll see on top of Google search bar and, and everything else we see the whole search engine process. There are servers that we connect to to get that information. Um, but of course, we don't want to memorize the specific IPv4 and IPv6 addresses of those servers, right? So all we need to do is remember google.com and this, this magical thing called DNS will perform that lookup for us and um, figure out what IPv4 address our machine needs to go to to access these Google servers. So how do we solve this issue where machines can't actually use google.com? We utilize DNS, the DNS system to perform IP address lookups or translations for all of our host names. Therefore, even though we enter these common host names into our web browsers every day, DNS is always in the background, performing lookup operations to ensure that our host machines know where to connect. So DNS uses UDP port 53. Okay, next one, three list. Um, so you see this is my PC here, uh, this is my Windows PC. Um, so all I did was ping google.com, which is again the, the host name that I can remember very easily. So you see pinging google.com and you see the square bracket. This square bracket is the IP address, in this case an IPv6 address, 
that um, DNS on my machine resolved this host name too. So DNS went and said, hey, what's google.com? Um, and it asked its DNS server that question, and the DNS server responded and said, hey, google.com is 2607F8B0 4008 ETE colon colon 200 um, and that's why I see this in square brackets here. This is the actual IP address that my um, my laptop went to connect to. So you see respond from this IP address. So I didn't get a response from google.com. I got a response from an actual server with this IP address um, because my machine or my laptop doesn't know how to connect to google.com. He can only connect to this IP. Um, so just just a next um, command or, or a next way to view this information. So you see this ns lookup command. If you have a Windows machine, feel free to just open a command prompt window and type ns lookup and something. So in this case, I put ns lookup cfsi.co. So this is a domain name that I want to I want to make DNS um, resolve. So this is the DNS well, this is the server that I use to resolve it. Um, this is the well, the IPv6 address for that server itself. So this is the DNS server that answered my query or, or that made my query. Um, and this is the actual answer that that DNS server gave me. So you see name cfsi.co. So this is my host name there that I looked up. And the address pairing that, that came up was this IP address here. Um, so basically, if I want to connect to this website or this domain, um, my, my laptop or my browser will go and connect to this server, the, the server with this IP. Right? So that, that's what DNS does. It, it performs this translation between a human readable domain and a machine readable IP address. So therefore, in order to utilize or understand these host names, host machines must have valid DNS servers configured. These servers maintain a database of host name to IP address mappings, among, among other mappings, and respond with these mappings when queried. So this is an example of a new DNS record being created. Um, so you see a name there, um, and this is the, the fully qualified domain name or FQDN. So if you put like, uh, we could do mail.google.com, you could put mail here, and then it, the, the full FQDN will be mail.google.com. And this is the IP address um, that you want to respond with. So if you set up a server, you could say, um, I just purchased my server.rishi.com. Um, and I want, whenever anybody types that into their browser, I want them to be redirected to my server that I just configured on AWS or, or on Microsoft Azure. Um, and the IP address on that server is this. Well, it, it won't be this private IP. It will be something public, right? Um, but that's how we do it. This is how you could configure it, I think, on a Windows server. Yeah, this looks like Windows. Um, but this is how you'll configure it. And you'll point or, or redirect traffic to your server like this. So DNS servers are configured in a hierarchical structure, just like NTP. Host machines or end user devices usually have a host file in which they cast, cache host names to IP mappings that they have configured. So that's their first level of DNS. They have a, a little file called a host file and they will maintain those mappings. They will say google.com is this IP address, facebook.com is this IP address. Um, and the advantage of that cache is that it's fast, right? If they want to go to google.com, um, their browser just needs to go to this file and say, hey, I want to go to facebook.com. Tell me that IP there. And if it's in the file, it'll just pull back the information one time. It doesn't need to go to a DNS server. However, um, if the file doesn't have it, then it needs to go to its configured DNS server, which is called a recursive server, which means that the server itself also caches mappings. Um, and then those servers go to higher level domains, which also cache um, DNS entries uh, and it keeps going up in that hierarchical structure. So just like the NTP chain, we now have a DNS um, chain of various servers around the world that are caching um, DNS mappings. At the very top of this DNS hierarchical structure um, are the, the root servers, which, which are like the, the stratum zero servers for NTP. For, for DNS, they are root servers. So they are 13 root servers as of the time that I did this research. Um, they, they could have added more. But whenever you hear DNS root servers, think of, of that level one or that level zero um, DNS uh, server in, in this hierarchical chain. So this is what it looks like. So you have those root servers on top. Then you have the .coms and the edus and the gov and the inits and the mills and whatever .net. So that's at, at the right end of the domain. And then you go to the sef second level domain, 
which is your Microsoft or your example. So if you have like example.com, the root server will be just straight on the right. Just the thing that you do see is like an invisible dot. Then you come left once, and what's the, what's the last thing that you see? Um, from, from the first thing from the right, or the last thing that we read, since we read right to left, is, is the last bit of that domain, right? Dot com, or dot edu, or dot net. So, so that's how it goes here. Those are the high level things. So the, dot, the root is like an invisible dot at the end. Then we have the dot coms, which are the, the second highest level. Um, or, well, the first highest level, if you don't consider the root. And the second level domain here is the thing that comes right after. So like Microsoft.com, um, that's the second level domain here. Um, or example.com or Google.com, those are the second level domains. And then you can keep you can keep adding on subdomains to that. So you could put meal.google.com or rishi.meal.google.com and you could keep going like that and keep tacking on subdomains and keep going down. Um, so the, the chain is really from right to left in DNS. And you could order you could go straight down to the host level. Um, so you could have host a.meal.google.com and you could keep going on like that. Now there are multiple types of DNS records. The most popular type is called the A record which maps a host name to an IPv4 address. So like cfsi.co, that, that thing that I looked up, which gave us a name and an IPv4 address, that is an A record. Another popular type is a quad A record with these four A's, uh, which maps a host name to an IPv6 address. Um, so you saw google.com that I saw, um, you know, we, we looked up google.com and we got an IPv6 address in return. That is called a quad A record. Uh, once a host machine queries a DNS server for an A slash quad A record and receives the DNS reply, it can then connect to the IP address of its server, either through IPv4 or IPv6. So the whole purpose of DNS is just to provide that translation or, or that mapping between host teams that we can remember and IP addresses that machines can actually connect to. Um, and of course, these links will go into more detail about the different types of records and the whole hierarchical structure and stuff. But just to describe the rule of DNS that Cisco asks us to do, you now know the rule, which is to provide that mapping or that translation. Right, so moving right on to our next popular protocol called SNMP. So continue, continuing our discussions of popular protocols and their functions in network operations, we will now examine the Simple Network Management Protocol, or SNMP. In any enterprise network that you come across, you're likely to, likely to see some sort of monitoring implemented for network infrastructure. It makes little sense to spend years and millions of US dollars, most likely, implementing a network and then not implementing systems to monitor the infrastructure that makes up the network. The software that is implemented on many networks to monitor the devices is called the Network Management System, or NMS. These NMSs utilize a popular protocol called the Simple Network Management Protocol, or SNMP. To monitor devices. So we set up this, this thing called a network management system, which is basically a monitoring system, like a, a, what do you call it, like a DVR system, sort of. Um, but instead of monitoring cameras or, or monitoring, you know, different places around the building, these things monitor our routers and switches. That's what an NMS, or so a network management system, um, is. And how, how these NMSs do that? is they often use this protocol called SNMP, Simple Network Management Protocol. So using SNMP, the NMS manager usually queries the SNMP agent on a particular device, um, which is our routers and switches and firewalls and stuff, using an SNMP GET request. So um, the SNMP server will be this NMS that we set up, so it'll be like a server in our data center somewhere, and the SNMP agent will be a little bit of code embedded in our devices. So our routers and switches and firewalls and stuff, they usually run SNMP agents. Then the server could run what's called an SNMP GET request. Um, and that will be something like, um, firewall, I want to know how many packets you dropped in the last minute. Please tell me. And then that is what that SNMP GET request would um, contain. And then the agent responds with an SNMP response message. So the agent will respond and say, maybe 100. Alternatively, the SNMP agents can also send an unsolicited response to the NMS in the form of an SNMP trap. This is an alert message. So again, we will continue with the example. 
maybe the firewall um, can't wait to, for the, the server to query it and ask. Maybe the, the firewall says, hey, I need to send this immediately. Server, I just got flooded with a million um, drop packets. So I just had to drop a million packets from a DDoS attack or something like that. Um, so these, these traps are unsolicited messages. The, the server didn't ask for the messages first. The agent just decided to send this message on its own. So regular SNMP messages use UDP port 161, while SNMP traps use UDP port 162. So this is what it looks like. So you see NMS or manager. This is just a piece of software on a, on a server. Um, just to give some examples here, you have SolarWinds, Zabbix, OpenNMS. Um, you have a bunch of different things you could be running here. Um, people use a, a bunch of different software. Uh, Digicel uses SolarWinds. Flow it is Cacti as well. I'm not sure what Flow is using right now. Um, but yeah, every ISP and every enterprise will run its own NMS. Um, so you see, the request will go to the agent. So the agent is just a bit of code running on our router. Then the router will send a response back to the, the NMS, uh, which is just over here. So how many packets did you drop in the last minute? Or, or what is the bandwidth on the interface? Um, you could ask for a bunch of different interface, uh, information in, in SNMP. And the agent could just respond with the, the number or with the response. And the agent could also send a trap and say, look, this is a, a very important message. You need to know this immediately. Um, so a question. I didn't see the question type. Um, right, so describing SNMP functions. The first version of SNMP created was, of course, an SNMP v1. So we always, we always have to start off with 1, right? We can start off with 0, I guess. But in this case, we start off with 1. So version 1, as in SNMP version 1, introduced all of the functionality for communicating with an agent, um, as we just described. With version 1, however, the only security implemented was a password shared between the manager and the agent. And that password, um, right, so the question now. So does this command SNMP set? So set or get? So I didn't mention sets yet. There is a set. What? Yes. Okay, good. Um, right. So I would say all of the Cisco devices that I've come across have SNMP support. Um, so I don't think I don't think I'll go into the SNMP configs because that was removed. Um, but basically, just Google Cisco SNMP configs, um, and you'll see how to set this thing called the community string and, and how to set up um, different SNMP commands and I would say yes, most Cisco devices, or all Cisco devices that I've used so far, have SNMP support. You can do SNMP gets on them and read, you know, a bunch of different information. Um, once, once the config's correct, um, you can set it up and, and you could get information from it. Um, if you had apps, if it applies to all devices, then I would say no. Um, a lot of, you have, well, obviously you have unmanaged devices. And a lot of devices just do have SNMP support, a lot of the cheaper devices especially. Um, so basically SNMP is a monitoring protocol and a lot of vendors will just say, we want to cut costs and we don't want to implement that thing called this thing, the SNMP agent. We, we don't want to implement this bit of software um, in the device because it will drive our costs. Uh, but I have never seen Cisco not do that. So all of these Cisco devices that I've used have this SNMP agent on them, which means that I could have read SNMP responses um, and gotten SNMP, uh, well, get responses from them. So yeah. Um, right. So with SNMP version one, the only security, uh, yeah, no, see, um, the only security implemented was a password, which is shared between the manager and the agent, and that password is called a community string or simply a community. This community was unfortunately sent in plain text across the wire, which makes it unsafe, as it is vulnerable to a man in the middle sniff. So we're talking about the Wireshark thing, right? If you could see that packet coming across in Wireshark, you could see that community in plain text there. Um, so you could read device, read information from devices, which may be a security risk. SNMP v2 introduced a major update to the security of your protocol and introduced a special, uh, special get bulk message, which allowed a manager to more efficiently fetch large data sets from agents. So the get bulk message is like an improvement over the, the plain old get message which says, hey router, send me everything about all of your interfaces. And the router will just start sending all the information in once. As opposed to saying, um, hey router, send me um, bits per second on interface one. 
a router send me a bits per second on interface two, and just keep going like that. Um, it, it's inefficient, right? So the get bulk message um, improve that efficiency a little bit. However, SNMP v2 was complicated to, to implement, and many engineers in the community rejected it and stuck with SNMP v1 because of how simple communities were to implement. As a result, SNMP v2 c, so this is the difference um, between just the v2 and the v2 c here, SNMP v2 c was published, which restored the ability to use communities. Many engineers simply implemented SNMP v2 c in read only mode to limit the security weaknesses of the protocols. Um, now, you can also use SNMP set commands to change values on devices. I, I have never seen this implemented. Um, as I say here, it, it is a security risk. Um, so people usually use SNMP get requests and, and they manually configure what they have to configure. Um, if you need to change any values, you configure it through the command line and you just set up SNMP to read information from devices. Now, SNMP v3 is the current version and is the one with the best security. Using SNMP v3, we have three options available to us to implement. We have no auth, no priv, which is no authentication and no privacy. Um, well, so if you put this, you have no authentication and no privacy between the agent and the NMS, right? So you have no security, basically. It's the, the least secure version. You have auth and no priv, which means the agent authenticates the NMS but does not encrypt communication. So if the NMS asks for something, the agent will say, hey, so I'm using my password. I want to make sure you have permission to check this. Um, so that's what authentication is. So the agent will do that, but it doesn't encrypt any data that it sent. And then lastly, for, for the most secure version, you have auth proof. So you see the, the no can remove there, right? That's auth proof. The agent authenticates the NMS and it encrypts the traffic um, to, the, to the NMS as well. So this is the most secure version, right? So ideally, we want to implement um, SNMP v3 when we can to leverage its encryption capabilities. Um, in, in reality, at least in Trinidad, I can tell you most um, most ISPs at least don't use SNMP v3. Again, because it's complicated to set up, right? Um, if you get into the SNMP v3 commands, you'll see SNMP v2 is basically one or two commands. SNMP v3 could be like 10 or 15 commands, uh, depending on how complicated you want to set it up. Um, so it is very secure, but it's also complicated to set up. So, yeah. Um, so there's a, a overview of the different versions and just um, the security and the, the features that it implements. So plain test authentication using community strings, SNMP v2c, which is the most commonly used one as I have seen. Um, you still have that plain text authentication, but you have this, this bulk message now, and you have the ability to set the, the, the um, community strings as read-only. So you can't accidentally change something on your router. Then with V3, we get the, the strong security and we still have the bulk retrieval, but it's a bit more complicated to set up, which is why it hasn't seen widespread adoption yet. Now, another key concept to understand with all versions of SNMP is the management information base or MIB. The MIB is the hierarchical structure of information that is foldable using SNMP on a device. So when I say pollable, I mean, you know, NMS going in and polling the device. So asking the device questions about um, different things on it. So like, what is your bit rate? Um, how many packets did you drop? What is the temperature? Um, those kind of questions that you could poll the device for. So think of how many items may be of interest in a single router. Fan speed of every fan in the router, voltage, current in every power supply, bit sent and received from every port. You have a bunch of different things, right? So the MIB helps us organize this data into a logical tree-like structure. The complete description of an item in a MIB is called the item's object identifier, or OID. So for example, an NMS might pull the host name of a device at the OID .1.3.6.1.2.1.1.5.0. So this is just a big tree-like structure going down from the main trunk to a different branch, a different branch, a different branch, a different branch, all the way to get the host name. So basically, an NMS will pull the device and say, hey, I want the information that is stored in this. And it will send this information in that get request packet. And the device will go through its structure and find that this number corresponds to its host name. And it will respond and say, my host name is router1. Right? And that's it. This is just a way to arrange the information 
um, on the device because there's just so much information. So realistically, if you get into SNMP, what you're going to be doing is trying to find a MIP for a device just so that you could pull the device and ask it um, for, for different things that you want. So if you want to figure out you know, how hot a device is, your job will be to figure out what OID you need to pull to get that temperature information. Um, right, so, so that's like halfway-ish in the presentation. So give me like uh, two minutes and I'll get some water and stuff. And then we'll come back and, and we'll keep going on, on our protocols. So ask, ask any questions you want um, and I'll answer it before we go on. Um, so we, we're going to keep going on and we're going to talk about syslog and then DHCP clients and relays. Okay, so BRB. Uh, everybody still here? Give them an excellent. Uh, right, let's hit my message there if most of are still here. I just want to make sure nobody went uh, outside or anything. Okay, I'm not seeing any messages. So maybe people actually went outside. <laughs> 